There were women who experienced the wondrous self-giving love of Jesus. Women like Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. And in Luke's account, we read about how they and other women went to the tomb. So let us turn now to our New Testament reading from Luke, uh, oops, Luke 14 verses, I'm sorry, Luke 24 verses one through for 13. You can find this on your Pew Bible in the New Testament, page 90. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the disciples, to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what happened. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Come, O oh Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the light and reveal. Convict us, convert us, Consecrate us until we are wholly thine. And now, Lord, my prayer is simply this, that the words of my mouth and the words of all our hearts, that these will be found pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Former editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, now senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church, Greensboro, North Carolina, Jill Duffield has written the following about this Easter Day discovery. She is quoting linguist George Lakoff from David John Seal Jr.'s book, The New Copernicans. People think in frames. 
To be accepted, the truth must fit people's frame. If facts do not fit the frame, the frame stays and facts bounce off. Duffield continues, if you're coming to anoint a dead body, news of a living person does not fit the frame. No wonder they were perplexed. And yet, we know the truth that did not fit their frame, the truth that did not fit anyone else's frame for that matter. Grave secrets, Duffield continues, have a way of coming back to life. And when they do, those who discover them often have to reframe their whole entire life because all they thought was true, well, wasn't. Easter. Easter reframes everything causes us to ask ourselves, can it be? And if it can be, then what does that mean for the way I choose to live my life? Now, we are in good company when we ask questions like these. For ever since a life-ending cross succumbed to an empty tomb's life-giving resurrection, the church has been seeking to faithfully understand what this means for our lives individually and communally. In the words of Anselm, our theological understanding of today's events has often been fides quarens intellectum, faith-seeking understanding. Ours is a faith that dares to question and ventures to inquire what faith has to say to a world-weary souls. Souls in need of more than saccharine, ready-made answers to life's deepest questions. Perhaps this is the reason we keep returning to this Easter Day story for the last 2,000 plus years. Perhaps this is the reason we often ask of this holy day, is it true that new life can come from death-like circumstance? Perhaps this is the reason we keep showing up to this same place year after year to witness the miracle over and over again, to wonder, can it be? Now, this is how the women for Luke's text began that day. They showed up. They showed up in the routine of life, and they encountered something that changed their lives and changes our lives, for they left that encounter bearing witness to what they encountered. They began to tell their story. Now, to be clear, while they encountered something that changed their lives, while they experienced resurrection promise, they did not go there expecting resurrection they did not go there expecting to find hope. They went expecting to continue in their grief. They went to complete their death vigil. You see, they were there as the song goes, as we sang on Friday when they crucified my Lord. They saw Jesus die firsthand, and they did not expect that the story would go any further. As Luke writes, at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They fully expected death to have had the final word. Again, Luke writes, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body, and they were perplexed about this. It made no sense to them. It did not fit into their frame. And then as Luke's 
tells the story. Two men in dazzling clothes are standing beside them. The women are surprised. They're terrified. Then they hear the words that will forever change their lives. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. They find themselves caught in a narrative story that changes their life mission. Story. Story can do that to us. Story shapes us, forms us. Story grabs us right in the solar plexus, the, the, the very core of our being, and prompts us to live life in certain ways. Professor of philosophy at Calvin University right here in the great state of Michigan, James K.A. Smith writes the following about story. Stories can haunt and unsettle us, and the most skilled storytellers can do this with an economy of words. The imaginative expanse of story does not depend on the quantity of words. Rather, there can be a feel among the words that carry an aesthetic power disproportionate to their length. Smith goes on to give the example of the evocative power of words using the six-word story said to have been composed by the master of verbal economy, Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway wrote, For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Smith explains... In just six words, the story creates and invites us into a whole new world. Today, Easter Day, we might recall another succinct statement that has held our attention ever since it was first put to paper. He is not here, but has risen. And with those words... The women at the tomb, their story is changed, their purpose redirected. As Luke describes it, they are asked to remember, and it is in their recounting of what has happened and what has been said, that they return from the tomb, and they told all this to the eleven, and the rest the women became the very first ones to bear witness, to tell the glad good news story. They became the very first believers in resurrection. They haven't even seen the risen Lord yet. This scene, as Luke writes it, is one of discovery. How often do we approach life expecting death? How often do we return to those places which entomb us? We know they don't hold life for us, yet they draw us in. An addiction, an unhealthy relationship, that, that endless loop in our mind telling us we do not have permission to dream. We do not have permission to live. Perhaps today, Today is the day we approach the empty tomb with a new set of eyes and a new set of ears, a, a new set of encountering our world that we might entertain the possibility that there is a new conclusion, one that provides hope and life and joy, new ways of, of seeing, being, doing, believing to believe in the possibility that the question, can it be? can be answered with a yes. And that yes, God's yes, opens us up and shapes us to a new way of living, reminding us and prompting us to discover that we need not wander around in graveyards any longer. We need not give in to the malaise and despair of a hopeless existence. We need not have to go it alone any longer because we are part of a faith community.
that has been traveling this road ever since two men in dazzling clothes reminded the women in Luke's gospel. Jesus is not here. He is risen. Words which prompted the women to share the story of their encounter which then prompted Peter to get up from where he was, run to the tomb, look in and be amazed at what he saw. These words have sustained the church since her inception. These words have prompted the church to dream. These words have called us to discover God's place in our midst and our place in this world. The first Easter, those who went to the empty tomb thought they would encounter death. What they found was life, new life, resurrected life, reframed life. Easter reframes our outlook as we recall through our faith words from one of our Presbyterian creeds, in life and in death, we belong heart and soul, to which I will also add, even in death-like circumstances, we belong, heart and soul, to Almighty God. Easter is a call. Easter is our call that we are a people who can faithfully move from lament into hope. We know We know what lament is. We as a a people, as a community, as a nation, as a world, we are, are emerging through the other side of the pandemic. And yet there are times when we still feel the effects of grief, the despair as we come to terms with what this means for our communal psyche. We watch as wars in Ukraine and Gaza and other parts of the world, as these unfold before us in real time. We live in a time when the website Education Week has a page entitled, School Shootings This Year, How Many and Where? which as of the March 7th update reports, there have already been 10 school shootings since January 1st on K through 12 property involving death or injury. Lord knows we know what lament looks like. Lord knows we can know what hope looks like. And Easter reminds us that lament can turn into hope. The Christian mystic theologian Julian of Norwich puts it thus, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. John Lennon's paraphrase of Norwich's words put it this way, everything will be okay in the end. And if it is not okay, then it is not the end. Easter reminds that lament can turn into hope. We ask, can it be? Easter responds, yes. A young family had been waiting for Easter break for some time. It had been several years since they had all been together, and the family was going to meet at Grandma and Grandpa's farm in upstate New York. Friday night, they loaded the car, buckled everyone in, and started on the journey toward family. It was a long drive, and try as she might, the littlest grandchild in the back seat could not keep her eyes open. The family arrived in the middle of the night, quietly greeted their parents, then carried this littlest one up inside and tucked her into bed. In the morning, about early dawn, if you were awake, 
you would have heard tiny footsteps come down the stairs, make their way to the living room bay window, and the sight took her breath away. She had never seen anything like it before. She saw daffodils and tulips, new buds on trees, dew sparkling on the grass in the light of the rising sun. And she could not contain herself. And she woke everyone as she declared, it's new. The world is new. We ask. Can it be? Easter responds. Yes. Yes, it can. Alleluia and amen.